everyone. Um, or, you know, afternoon. Whenever you're watching this, it really is almost the afternoon anyway, so. <coughs> um, so good afternoon, I guess. Um, so, it's been a while since we had, like, an actual lesson that wasn't just going over, um, the PLP or how we were going to do online class. Um, so as you can see, I've decided it makes a little bit more sense <coughs> to just record the lectures because I just I think we all kind of like need that flexibility right now I mean I guess there's also the argument that like routine is good but I don't know I feel like things are just weird for everyone so this way you can just watch the lecture like whenever you have time um okay so I think that we didn't really talk that much about modernism so if we did you can skip this part of my lecture but I'm just going to start with that um, or start with the parts that I'm not sure we've gone through yet at least and then we're gonna talk a bit about Alice Dunbar Nelson, um, Mr. Baptiste, and I sit and sew. So that's that's on the docket for today. Um, all right so modernism was as the book says um, it was the early 20th century, 1914 to 1939, and this was an age of anxiety for men, but according to our editors, an age of exuberance for women, because men saw their power slipping, um, they saw themselves, or they were, <clears throat> they were losing faith in a lot of like societal institutions, um, and so, like religion, um, the government, which had sent them to war in World War One. um, <clears throat> Etc. So men are kind of like like things are not working out for them, I guess, um, or at least changing. But for women, you know, they never had societal power. So if you're a woman and you sort of feel the ground beneath you slipping at this time, um, it actually provides opportunity for some kind of like increased participation in society, um, more power, and so you see that when women get the right to vote in the United States, for example. Uh, so some of the things that were going on at this time would be World War I, um, women getting the vote, as I just said, um, and then World War II, oh, before that, the stock market crash of 1929, um, Great Depression, and World War II kind of bookends this period. So high modernism is between 1914 and 1939, so the two world wars. Um, so during World War I, um, men were told that they were going to be fighting for their country and that this was like a really good and honorable thing to do. But the reality of war was like these disgusting trenches, um, just this like post-apocalyptic or like apocalyptic awfulness really. Um, and this was also like in 1918, 1919, like that was also when the Spanish flu, um, the last really bad pandemic we had swept the world and it spread really quickly, partly because of troop movements um, and because they were like in these trenches and people were like sick and like, it was just terrible. And so um, men kind of lost faith in this idea that like, it is sweet and good to die for your country. like say at decorum asked. I don't know if you like know that poem, but um, it's so there was a sense that war was for nothing. Their deaths and their suffering were in vain. Um, and this is something that Dunbar Nelson wrote about in I Sit and So, so keep that in mind. Um, this was also when Freud kind of came on the scene. So he published The Interpretation of Dreams in 1900. So people were for the first time realizing that like their very sense of self was something that they didn't fully have a grasp on, you know. So they were told for the first time that there was like, you know, a conscious self, but there was also a, a subconscious self um, that was shaped by childhood, your parents, your, um, and your desires. So that was also very unsettling for people to be told that their personalities actually depended on these like suppressed erotic desires, um, which isn't like necessarily true, but that was Freud's idea. And he, you know, is the grandfather of psychoanalysis. So, um, <clears throat> so 
so I like this, um, the way the book puts it, is what the human mind experiences as knowable is not necessarily all there is of the mind. Um, so it gives you this kind of, it gave people a fragmented concept of the self, like the self was not a unified like, being. Um, in 1905 and 1916, Einstein published his two theories of relativity. Um, so people were also realizing that like the very nature of the universe itself was something that was incomprehensible, um, absolutely not based on what it looked like, you know, like the universe is both infinite and ever expanding. Um, that was a real paradigm shift, right? Because like, if you just look out the window or look at the sky, um, you can't tell that. So a lot of things that kind of went counter to people's logical understanding of like the world around them. Um, let's see. This was also the time of the decline of the British Empire and the rise of fascism in Europe, um, which was both Hitler and also Franco in um, Spain and Mussolini in Italy. Um, although that was later. Or no, that was that was during World War Two. So I think Franco was the earliest, but we can look that up, sorry. Um, okay, so the decline of the British Empire, the rise of fascism, um, so there was both an Irish and an Indian movement for independence, those are both British colonies, and in the U.S. in the 1920s, the KKK grew to its peak. Um, so racism was widespread in the South, but also in the North as black Americans started like moving away from the South to escape. Um, the racism. So you saw things like, um, you know, like people being kept out of neighborhoods in New York and Chicago and places like that. Um, there was also <clears throat> a lot of persecution of immigrants and there were immigrant quotas set. Um, there was like quotas set to try to keep the United States at its ethnic makeup from, I believe, 1892. So a lot of a lot of these sort of anxieties about like the other and like other countries came out um, in the United States as this uh, this really <clears throat> xenophobic sort of racism um, and this rhetoric around you know keeping the United States the way it was right like make it how it was in the past which I remind you of something okay. Um, so in 1918, prohibition was passed, which lasted till 1933, so alcohol was legal in the United States, um, but people still made it and they still drank it. And in 1917 was the Russian Revolution. Um, <clears throat> so many modernists had fascist sympathies, um, so T.S. Eliot was one of those, Ezra Pound absolutely was one of those. Um, but many other modernists were anti-fascism and anti-capitalist. So these two kind of conflicting movements in the world at the time, communism and fascism, were really influential on like writers in, you know, England and America as well. Um, <clears throat> so modernism was born in the sense that new aesthetic modes were needed to respond to a changing world. Um, the manifesto as a genre became a thing. So a manifesto is like when someone or a group of artists would write um, like a document that put forward their artistic ideals and like what they thought art should do. And they were usually pretty, um, the tone of them was often kind of oppositional, right? So manifestos were meant to like separate themselves from the work that came before. Um, so let's see what else. Many writers at the time were expats. So modernism was a very um, international movement and you know many of the people we consider American modernists still kind of spent most of their lives like in Paris or elsewhere. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, so I actually I did want to read you guys like an example of a modernist manifesto. <laughs> um, so one of the this is a really short one. It's called The Revolution of the Word. Let's see if it'll live. Um, so this should just give you a good sense of like what manifestos did. Um, 
The revolution in the English language is an accomplished fact. The imagination in search of a fabulous world is autonomous and unconfined. The literary creator has the right to disintegrate the primal matter of words imposed on him by textbooks and dictionaries. Um, the writer expresses, he does not communicate. The plain reader be damned. Um, and I think that idea of the plain reader be damned is really important um, specifically for modernism because many modernists were kind of um, on the one hand, obsessed with this idea of like making make it new, right? And the it in that statement is both art itself, make art new, and also take old cultural modes of like, I guess like production kind of, and, and make those new. So um, modernists were very much concerned with like old stories and changing them. So like they would have a lot of allusion to myth, a lot of allusion to the Bible. Um, <clears throat> So the ideal reader for a modernist was someone who was very highly educated so that they could understand all these references. Um, okay. <clears throat> the modern short story was invented, um, which was meant to capture the purity of a timeless moment, which I think, I don't know, we can kind of, we can think that through as we're looking at the Dunbar Nelson. Popular art also exploded, so there was a rise of mass media at the time as well. Um, and some modernists, even though many modernists felt that like you know mass media and like popular culture was just ruining um, art itself, many modernists actually like had a, like also wrote um, popular stuff so that they could make money because modernist work wasn't didn't sell hard to read. Okay. <clears throat> Modernism and women. Very important here. So our editors of this book actually, um, Sandra Gilbert and Susan Gubar, wrote this essay that you, sorry, a garbage truck at noon. Um, so you might want to check this essay out, like if you're interested. Um, so T.S. Eliot, his modernist manifesto is called Tradition and the Individual Talent, and it deals with this idea that for male modernists, um, they had to kind of grapple with this idea of like the literary forefather. So like all the men who came before, like the weight of that, um, I don't know, like that canon, I guess, of just male writers. Um, but he didn't, you know, even say male writers, he just said writers, and he meant male writers. Um, and Sandra Gilbert and Susan Gubar wrote like a response to that essay called Tradition and the Female Talent that talks about how women um, look to the women who came before them not as um, not as models to compete with but rather as like inspirations because women had so few um, like people to look up to, right? Like as writers, um, because even you know the women we read and stuff, like a lot of like the canon at the time wouldn't have included them. You know, it would have been men instead. So you might, I don't know, you might want to look into that. Um, okay, so images of women produced by modernist men were often very negative. Um, there was a real obsession with what women should and should not be, which you know might remind you of Victorianism. Um, so, if you look in male authored modernist books, um, there's often sort of this archetype of the flapper, which represents um, male anxieties about feminine empowerment. Um, you can see this if, you, if anyone's ever read The Sun Also Rises. Brett is a really good example of this. Um, I think Daisy is also an example of this in, uh, you know, <laughs> The Great Gatsby. <laughs> Um, okay, so female ambition was really seen as like destructive by a lot of men and male writers at the time. So even though they wanted to like make art new and change everything around, um, there were limits and women was where the buck stopped, I guess, for a lot of them. So, <clears throat> um, and I think that's kind of, you know, something that we still see today, right? Like, I think that there's still, um, it's, it's 
still not maybe as encouraged as it should be to be an ambitious woman. Um, I think ambition in women is still a little bit stigmatized, which like you guys can discuss in the discussion thread. Um, I have all these discussion questions, but we can't we cannot discuss them because I'm just recording this. Um, okay. <coughs> Um, Freud's theories also blamed everyone's psychological problems on their mothers. So whereas when you look back to Victorianism, there was at least this idea that like there was a right way to be a woman, right? Like you could you could be like this perfect like angelic domestic mother figure, um, and don't write and don't you know don't stir the pot, but during the period of modernism, even mothers became like a reviled category in some ways because they were seen as like responsible for all of men's problems because that was like what Freud said happened, you know, like the mother um, is who shapes her children. Um, and there, was, there wasn't really much, you know, discussion, I guess, of the father's role or maybe not quite as much discussion of the father's role especially because there was all this like weird stuff about like you know like repressed like sexual desires that men have toward their mothers like that's, that's the Oedipus complex if you've ever heard of that um so changing attitudes toward mothers I guess is what you're kind of looking at here um however as all this was happening um women's lot in life was slowly improving. So education and labor rights slowly got better. Women got the vote in 1920 with the 19th Amendment. Um, by the end of World War I, um, which created a very wide gap in male and female experiences. Uh, but by the end of that war, working women had increased by 50% in England. Um, women began wearing more comfortable clothes, like. Um, shorter skirts, bras instead of corsets. Um, in 1916, Margaret Sanger established the first birth control clinic um, in America. She called this a revolt against sex servitude. Um, there was a bit of a movement for free love or companionate marriage at the very least. So women were kind of pushing for more sexual freedom, which was something that men had kind of always had. Um, and women wanted it too now, right? And they also wanted to be in marriages where they felt like they were equals and like they were partners and not just property or, you know, servants or whatever. Um, <clears throat> so the first, for the first time in history really, modernism gives women the sense that they are heirs to their own literary history. So this is, again, like tradition in the individual talent, tradition in the female talent, two essays that deal with this. Um, and they found it, many of them found it, empowering and inspiring. Um, so women novelists explored female lives and experiences. Um, they wrote about a lot of protagonists who found themselves at odds with their societies. And they were trying to create a new linguistic cadence so a new way of using language that would be free from patriarchal models, um, which is also what modernism on a larger scale was trying to do as well, was like create new ways of using language um, that sort of broke with old, with old ways. Okay. Um, So I just wanted to So the end of our um, passage on early 20th century literature, it just I really like what it says about Virginia Woolf here, so I'll just read it to you guys. Um, when Virginia Woolf wrote of women, she wrote of a generation as adventurous in its exploration of experience as the Elizabethan men had been in their exploration of the globe. The women whom Mrs. Wolf knew were exploring the professional world, the political world, the world of business, discovering that they themselves had legs as well as wombs, brains as well as nerves, reason as well as sensibility, 
their Americas lay within themselves and altered the map as profoundly as any added by Cabot or Columbus. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so we will turn to Alice Dunbar Nelson then. Um, I hope I didn't, I really can't remember how much modernism we did, um, but we'll find out. Okay. Alice Dunbar Nelson was born in New Orleans. She's Creole. Um, she printed her first collection in 1895 and eventually married Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who's like a very, very famous poet, um, and moved to New York City where she worked as a teacher. Uh, eventually they divorced due to his alcoholism. She, um, she remarried the publisher of the Wilmington Advocate. Um, and she spent her whole life like working for racial justice. She was really, um, it was important to her to create a more equal world racially. Um, and she was also a, a black woman in America at a time when things were, you know, worse than they are now. Um, okay, so I really just have a lot of discussion questions for us about Mr. Baptiste. So some of those I will put on uh, Moodle and you guys can respond to them. Um, but some of the things I guess I want to point out about this story. The first line, he might have had another name, we never knew. Um, so right away we have this um, narrator established that's not an I, it's not a single observer, so rather we never knew. So you have this sense that there's kind of like this, this crowd or this community who is um, watching and like understanding or just I guess observing what's going on with Mr. Baptiste, um, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, I think there's a bit of condescension, right, from the narrator's attitude. So because we have this um, this like first person like plural narrator, we, um, there's a sense that the narrator is not just one person whose attitude matters towards Mr. Baptiste, but like that we're getting what the whole community thinks about him. So he doesn't have a name other than what they call him. And he's really, his smallness is emphasized throughout. So he was a mild mannered little man. Um, He's, a, he's considered, see, these spots are almost the busiest on the levee, and the rough seamen and longshoremen have least time to be bothered with small, weak folks, which meaning Mr. Baptiste is small and weak. Um, so we really get this sense of him as um, maybe disrespected, but also, like, I feel like there's kind of this weird, like, innocence almost too of like this constant emphasis that he's, he's small he's weak he's not I don't know he's he's um yeah I guess he's small and, and weak um and just this um <clears throat> where exactly this is. Um, no, here we go. Okay, so in his first description, <clears throat> um, again, he was small. So this is on page 167 in the second paragraph. Most Creole men are small when they are old. Um, Mr. Baptiste was furthermore very much wrinkled and lame. Like the son of man, he had nowhere to lay his head, save when some kindly family made room for him in a garret or a barn. He subsisted by doing odd jobs, whitewashing, cleaning yards, doing errands, and the like. Um, so I think this comparison to Christ is very important. Um, and I mean, I think it signals that we should be looking at Mr. Baptiste as a Christ figure. Um, so in literature, I mean, this is pretty self-explanatory. 
self-explanatory, but in literature, a Christ figure um, is someone who's used to draw like a comparison between Jesus and this person's experience. Um, so it's just a character who who parallels some of the life of Christ. It doesn't have to be everything about his life. Um, so um, they might have, they might like fight for justice. Um, they might display loving kindness and forgiveness. They might die and particularly be martyred in that death, um, perform miracles, etc. So just everything Christ did, if you like kind of apply that to a character in literature, um, if the parallels are there enough, then they might be a Christ figure. And I kind of see Mr. Baptiste as a Christ figure because, first of all, the author gives us, you know, an explicit comparison to Jesus but also because his death is not quite a martyring, but it's made very, very clear to us that he was meek and would not harm anyone. And so when he does eventually die, um, I think it's, I mean, this kind of like senseless death. Um, and this story, tells us um, that he was the first life lost in this struggle, um, in the strike. Okay. Um, I also was like a little unclear on what strike this was about, so like if anyone knows New Orleans history better than I do, please let me know. Um, there was a, there was a strike in 1892 in November. Um, that would have included like all the dock workers and that was also successful but in 1892 the strike was in November and this story really emphasizes like how hot it is and I just feel like it wouldn't have been this hot in November in New Orleans. I mean it would have been hot probably but not not the way they describe it um, in the story so I wasn't really sure. Um, but I guess, you know, just general, may have just been general labor unrest, which, as we know at this time, there was, there was a lot of work toward more labor rights. Um, okay. So, it is also important that we have a lot of, like, Creole vernacular in this story. <clears throat> um, so if you look on page 168, ah, mon dieu, it will drive the fruit away, misère, it will, we, oui, we. Oui. So they're kind of speaking like sort of Creole French. Um, and I think this is really important because, you know, Jen Barton Nelson herself was um, a Creole writer. And by using the language of New Orleans um, Creole society, she was um, implicitly elevating that language to the status of like high literature. Um, so that's, that's important. Um, mm -hmm. So I think The Irishman is also a good example of how this community seems to treat Mr. Baptiste. Um, he calls him the little fruit eater. It's on page 169. By Howley St. Patrick, here's that little fruit eater. Um, so they, he seems to be someone that everyone kind of, you know, is patronizingly accepting of um, until he asserts his own opinion. Um, so I think this really shows like the, the limits of um, what it was to be a person, a, a man like Mr. Baptiste who, you know, he didn't seem to have any family, he didn't seem to have any money or income, um, he was sort of one of, like, society's, I don't know, underdogs, I guess. So, 
I think the Irishman kind of reveals that um, that attitude, right? Uh, let's see. And so you'll see too when Mr. Baptiste says like, "Ah, oh, mon Dieu, does fruit shit be ruined? Fit food do strike?" Um, the Irishman says, "Damn the fruit! It ain't the fruit we care about; it's the cotton." So this real like absolute lack of empathy for Mr. Baptiste's situation. The Irishman is just like he just cares about the strike. Um, and then um, we have this moment where the Irishman yells scabs, men come on, this is the bottom of 169. Um, so scabs are, as you probably know, people who work while other, others are striking and like you, you, should, you should not do this. This is like very anti labor rights. Um, but in this story, um, we're given a more complex depiction. So to me, the story is really like on one level, very much about race. Um, because Mr. Baptiste, who's Creole, seems to sort of fall somewhere in the middle, right? Like the, the Irish men sort of deal with him. They don't seem to perceive him in the same, like, <clears throat> you know, like dehumanizingly racist way that they're looking at the black men who are working um, as scabs um, with this repeated use of the N-word and then kill him, right? But he doesn't, I mean, he doesn't get treated like he's white either and then you know this is also complicated by like the way Irish people were perceived at the time as also not being white um so um ultimately we see this kind of just vicious racism towards the people who are scabs because the thing to remember is that like at this time if you were um, like if you were black, you probably didn't have a ton of labor opportunities. So these black men were just kind of doing what they had to. Like it wasn't necessarily, you know, I don't think they were trying to ruin the strike um, so much as they just needed money. Um, so it's this real, like I feel like there's sort of a, everyone has their motivation in the story, right? Like this sort of desperation of those who need to work scabs, the desperation of Mr. Baptiste who survives of this kind of tenuous fruit trade situation that he's worked out, um, and then the, um, the desire of like the Irish men and like the, all the, all, everyone who works on the dock for like better labor practices. Um, so all of these interests kind of come to a head in the end. <coughs> um, so Finnegan takes a giant block of stone from the ground and hurls it into the ship, the hold of the ship. And you'll see this, this is on 170, um, the description of Finnegan. Finnegan was a titan, which means he was very big. So you can contrast this with the way Mr. Baptiste is portrayed over and over again as being really small and weak. Um, so he breaks their ships, and then um, the, the workers, the scabs, are obviously really mad and start throwing pieces of brick and wood and iron at the, the dock workers. Um, I love this description. It was pandemonium turned loose over a turgid stream with a malarial sun to heat the passions to fever point, which is, again, like why I don't think it's set in November. Like, I think malarial sun to me is like, you know, like August, like that deep, deep summer. Um, and then Mr. Baptiste had taken refuge behind a bread stall on the outside of the market. He had taken off his cap and was weakly cheering the Negroes on. Bravo, cheered Mr. Baptiste. And then one of the Irishmen says, will you look at that damned fruit-eaten Frenchman? And then he throws a brick at him. So this is the only moment in the whole story where we see Mr. Baptiste really like assert himself at all, um, assert his opinions, you know, cheer for the, the black men. So he's um, asserting his 
uh, I guess his like sense of loyalty to them um, and not to the to the Irishmen, and immediately he pays for that with his life. Um, Mr. Baptiste <clears throat> lay very still with a great ugly gash in his wrinkled brown temple. Fishmen and vegetable marchands gathered around him in a quick, sympathetic mass. The individual, the concrete bit of helpless humanity, had more interest for them than the vast, vague, fighting mob beyond. Killed instantly, said the surgeon, carefully lifting Mr. Baptiste into the ambulance. Tramp, 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 sounded the militia, steadily marching down Decatur Street. Um, and so, at the end of the story, this narrator addresses you, the reader, with the assumption that you are, fam are familiar with what was going on in New Orleans at this time. You remember, of course, how long the strike lasted and how many battles were fought and lives lost before the final adjustment of affairs. It was a fearsome war, and many forgot afterwards whose was the first life lost in the struggle. Poor little Mr. Baptiste, whose body lay at the morgue unclaimed for days before it was finally dropped unnamed into Potter's Field. Um, so, to me, I mean, I'm sure there are other readings too but to me this story is really about like the way we remember historical events um so when we think about the labor strikes it's easy to just think of them as um i guess in these like large terms of like what was gained and how it was gained but in this story dunbar nelson is kind of shining light on this moment of um someone who wasn't even involved, who was affected, like, a, you know, just this life lost with no one to remember him, um, except for the people narrating the story. So I will put discussion questions for this story on Moodle as well. And now we've still got, if we are doing a 50 minute class, which I guess I'm going to get there, honestly, 13 minutes. Um, I just, you know, we'll see how long this takes, but um, I sit and sew. So Dunbar Nelson was not, she didn't write that much poetry. Um, she was more of a, she wrote more fiction. So this is sort of like a rare poem of hers, I guess. Um, and I think it's very clear, like she's, she's clearly trying to state something with this poem, so. I sit and sew, a useless task it seems. My hands grow tired, my head weighed down with dreams. The panoply of war, the martial tread of men, grim-faced, stern-eyed, gazing beyond the ken of lesser souls, whose eyes have not seen death, nor learned to hold their lives but as a breath. But I must sit and sew. I sit and sew, my heart aches with desire, that passion terrible, pageant terrible, sorry, that fiercely pouring fire, on wasted fields and writhing grotesque things once men. My soul in pity flings, appealing cries, yearning only to go there in that holocaust of hell, those fields of woe, but I must sit and sew. The little useless seam, the idle patch, why dream I here beneath my homely thatch? When there they lie in sodden mud and rain, pitifully calling me, the quick ones and the slain. You need me, Christ, it is no roseate dream that beckons me, this pretty futile seam, it stifles me. God, must I sit and sew. Um, so, this was published in 1920 about World War One. Um, so this poem is about her role during the war. So Alice Dunbar Nelson, as we know, was black and black women were not accepted um, to serve as nurses in the war in, when we entered in 1917. Um, so in this poem, she talks about her, like the 
the desire she has to be helping, right? Like she wants to be there helping men who are injured in the trenches, but because of um, people being racist, she wasn't she wasn't allowed to go. Um, so let's see. I mean, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. I think like the second stanza is maybe where you see some of that just the, the language she uses, like the power of her diction is really clear here. So my heart aches with desire, that pageant terrible, that fiercely pouring fire on wasted fields and writhing grotesque things once men. So her depiction of trench warfare is very vivid and horrifying. Um, she calls it a holocaust of hell, those fields of woe, but I must sit and sow. Um, so this also really illuminates kind of the differing experiences of men and women during this war. So like if you didn't go and serve as a nurse, um, you would have maybe been working um, in any variety of jobs that men had vacated in England and the United States, or you might be sewing, um, which I think refers to sewing like war uniforms. Um, which is just not as useful, I guess. Um, and of course we know, like we've seen lots and lots of work that deals with this, but sewing as really symbolic of like a woman's place, um, that she's been relegated to, not a place that she wants to be. Okay. Um, so I think what's kind of interesting about this poem too is the way that she, like, depicts the peacefulness of her life. So why dream I here beneath my homely thatch? So like in her cozy like house, you know? Um, when there they lie in sodden mud and rain, pitifully calling me the quick ones and the slain. So she really is feeling this deep desire not to be comfortable during this horrible world altering event, but rather to do whatever she can to help. Um, but um, unfortunately, she can't do anything. Um, <clears throat> and I mean, I think it's, you know, it's a good poem for now, um, as we sort of find ourselves facing this, um, you know, historic pandemic that Find all of humanity in our vulnerability to something that is, you know, a common enemy, um, which we haven't had in a long time. It's also kind of interesting to, I don't know, keep in mind that, you know, this was written in 1920, like all these authors like lived through the Spanish flu pandemic. Um, I don't know. Uh, So, yeah, I mean, I think this poem is just about sort of feeling impotent in the face of disaster, feeling like you can't do anything, um, and also about how absolutely dehumanizing this war was. So again, like, think about, you know, modernism itself, um, a movement that was really marked by, like, the sense of, like, societal alienation, the brokenness of institutions, the loss of faith in institutions. Um, that was partly because of this awful trench warfare um, and the way that, you know, the, the heroism of war was not a real thing. Like, people were seeing that war was just brutal and cruel and bloody and, like, disgusting and um, just this meaningless suffering. So, um, all right. I'm, I 
I guess that's, I guess that's it. Um, so I hope this was informative um, and that you feel like you have a grasp on modernism and Alice Dunbar Nelson. Um, so if you have any questions, I'm going to post a discussion forum as well. And I'll be like looking at that and answering stuff on it. Um, so yeah, thank you for attending uh, my first digital lecture for Women's Lit. Um, there will be more of these and I will, I will be posting them more regularly as I kind of get into the swing of just quarantine life, I guess. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll see you guys soon. Um, let me know if you need anything. Have a good day.